about another woman, uh, Naomi. Like many moms who are here, Naomi plays a role in the background, which is pushing her children up so that they can shine. And many of us had moms that were like that too. But maybe you wished as kids that they played a bigger back <laughs> role in your life, but when you look back at it, they did some things for you from the behind the scenes to help you rise to an occasion to shine. And we get to see that with Naomi in the story. And so we're going to look at it as a drama during the time of Judges, and we're going to look at it in three different acts. Um, so we're going to see how this story uh, plays out about a, uh, about a godly mother who really, truly uh, has all the reasons to, to not portray godly characteristics because of what happened to her in her life, but she shows uh, this great faith uh, gets God's favor, and, and, and we get to kind of see how the story unfolds. So, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ruth. Uh, we'll start in chapter 1, we're going to float around here, and the first act is Act 1, and we're going to be talking about this godly faith that comes from a mom. Really, I, I want you to just think about this, because this story can sound maybe similar for you, maybe not all the things that happened to Naomi, but... And some of you may have been that case for your mom, and, and how you saw them get through some things also helped you as well. So, in the first seven verses, ooh, kind of fun reading that, on that little screen back there, my eyes, I realized just recently, I'm getting old. And it says, one through seven, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his sons were Mahalon and Kilian. And they were uh, Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they lived there about ten years, both Mahalon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons. And her husband. When she heard that in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughter in law prepared to return home from there. For the two, uh, with her two daughter in law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road and would take them back to the land of Judah. I want to say we're going to find this out as we delve into this even more, but Naomi really was a person who lived out her faith. She lived it out in pretty much everything that she did. And, and i got to tell you, it's really easy for us as people uh, to really do the, the things that we strike out on people the most is in our families. Because in our, in, in our inner circles, that is where we feel the most comfortable, where we can let our hair down, and maybe we would say things that we really wish we wouldn't say because... You know, we ultimately trust them, and then we air out some things we wish we really wouldn't have. In this case, all these things are starting to unfold with Naomi, but we don't see her do this. We don't see her act out in that kind of a way. She does something even, um, she does something that, that is, you can only tell it comes from God in the way that she approaches the situation. I want to say a story. So back in, um, I don't know how long ago this was, but there was a tropical area where a lot of Americans lived. This is uh, years back. There was this, uh, I don't know if it was a disease or a parasite or something that went around and it caused blindness. And the symptoms were really easy to see. And once you saw those symptoms, you had five days before you went blind. And it really manifested itself mostly in young American children that were living there. They didn't know if it was from an, an immune defic deficiency or something like that. But once you saw the signs, you knew that your kid was going to have five days before they went blind. And so there was uh, this time where this American woman wakes up and she notices in her daughter that some of these signs were starting to appear. So she did what any parent would do and she rushed her kid to the doctor. And as she's sitting there with the doctor, her worst fears were un un unveiled to her that her daughter definitely had this and that she was going to be blind. So she grabs her daughter by the hand and walks immediately out of the hospital and goes to this field. And she picks up her daughter in her arms and she has her, pulls her up by her face and has her look out in this field that was covered with wildflowers and trees. And, and she told her daughter, she said, take this in. Do you see how the sun hits the flowers and how, how it, you know, it makes this beautiful color across the grass? And she wanted her to take that in. And then she picked up a flower, a 
a yellow one held it next to her and said, let's look at this flower. And they examined the flower, the petals, the stem, the leaves. They talked about how beautiful it was, and it only could have come from God that could create something this beautiful. And after, after they looked at the flower and after they went through all that, she grabbed her daughter's face and she pulled it near hers and she asked her some questions. She said, what color is mommy's hair? And her daughter said, it's black and it's beautiful. What color are mommy's eyes? Your eyes are blue, it's just like the sky. And this one will end to kiss you. Here got me. She grabs her and looks into her eyes and says, what do you see in mommy's eyes? And her daughter says, mommy, I see love. I see love, Mom. In this case, moms, and, and I guess everybody, when your kids look into your eyes, do they see love? Do they see God in your eyes and the things that you're going to be doing? Where you're leading them, where you're calling them to be, the example that you're setting. If you grabbed your kid and you knew that they weren't going to see much longer, you just want them to remember who you are and what you look like and all these different things. But really what you want to know the most is when they look into your eyes, they see, I see God through your eyes, mommy or daddy or brother or whatever it is. Naomi had this feature because later we find out that as she's going towards Judah, she understands in her kids these daughter-in-laws that she had, you guys might as well go back home. You might as well go back home, live with your parents, find new husbands. Both of them saw in her that she was this godly woman, there was something about her, because they both said, no, we can't leave. We're not going to leave. And she insisted, you really should go home. I, what can I do for you? I can't make young men again and give you somebody else to marry. So you should go. So Orpah comes up and gives her a hug and kisses her on the cheek, and they, they part ways, and she goes back home. But Ruth, she says something, and I, I don't have this up here for you, but I want to read it, because this is something that um, I hope that we would see, that we would, we would have this impact on other people as well. She's, Ruth replied when she told her to go, she said, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. But, but the Lord deal with me, but if ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Ruth looked into the eyes of Naomi and saw God. And she wanted to be where Naomi was going to be. She wanted to follow in her mother-in-law's footsteps. Where she went, she wanted to be. Where she called her to go, she was going to go. And in that, she saw that this woman just lost her husband, just lost her son, felt that God may have been punishing her, but never once cursed God in the process. And just asked him and followed him and wanted to be where he was going to be. This pursuit and this idea of this, this love that only, uh, I don't think everybody has it, even though we may feel like we're really close to God. But sometimes when things just go south, we have a hard time dealing with God because we think, why are you doing this to me? What did I do to you? Naomi embraces this and kind of moves forward. So Act 2 leads us into this favor that she receives. Not just that Naomi receives, but this favor that comes from, one, Naomi being a godly woman, Ruth following, having faith, not just in God, but seeing that godly faith in Naomi and wanting to know what it's about. Follows suit. And favor from all of this. So we're going to continue on in chapter 2. It says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. It's from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth and Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go uh, to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone who is in the eyes that I find favor. Left behind the grain in his eyes that they find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went and, and began to glean the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Usually in this case, you got to realize this, this kind of fits a little bit with our world today. Maybe you might be able to, to get this. Ruth is a foreigner in a place that is not her place. She's going into a field to work, to get scraps, to provide whatever she can, not just for herself, but for also her mother-in-law. They could have easily have been taken advantage of, 
the workers could have probably done whatever they wanted to do to this young, maybe attractive, I don't know, maybe not, woman, because who is going to tell? She's not from here. She doesn't belong here. Maybe the other women that were gleaning also behind her who were from there may have treated her with disrespect and pointed fingers at her and told her to get out of here, whatever it is. But we don't see that. What we do see is a response from Boaz later, which is incredible because word gets around about your character. Word gets around of, of your faith and what you're trying to do and, and where you go. And so we see this, this later. And so we see it. Oh, that's later. Sorry, whoever I just pointed in the eyeball. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I gotta go back to my dad. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the jars that the men have filled. At this, she bowed her head down, face to the ground. She explained, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you didn't even notice me, a foreigner? Well, I replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. There's this time where the things that you never know are going to turn out. She didn't know what was going to happen when she followed her mother-in-law to this place. She just saw within her, I want to be where you're at. I trust you. I see that you're goodness for me. I want to just uh, kind of throw this out there for parents who, who want their kids to follow in good standing of what you were trying to get them to do. The best way we could ever do that, and I'm a learning in progress here, the best way I could ever get my kids to trust what I say to them and to get them to live a life that I know I want them to have is by me trusting and living the life that God wants for me. And the more that I follow what he's asking me to do, the more that I trust in his ways, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it hurts a little bit, or whatever it may be, and, and just lean on his understanding and follow in his ways. Amen. And do that example and show them that example. Then maybe they'll say, I want to be like that. Where you go, I will go. Buried right next to you. You need to get a job first. I'm going to pick on one that's in here. But that's what we want, right? We want our kids to follow the example that we are trying to follow by that gift of Christ who lived a life. And we look at him. And we want to be like him. If I want my kids to be a godly person, I should start acting the most uh, reflection of Christ that I can too. And then you never know where the favor comes that you're going to find in the most unexpected places. Not only did she find favor by Boaz, Boaz also told his workers, I need you to leave a little extra grain. I need you to leave a little more. There's no reason for it. But she needs, she needs it, and I heard what she did. And I want her and Naomi to be blessed. God shows up in ways that we can't understand why. And they weren't even asking for it at that point. She just wanted to help take care of her mother in law Because of her mother's faith had led her there. And all of this struggle and all of this approach of, of, of getting pulled out of your normal life and getting pulled in something else, a family list less group of people now join in to a great family tree. We see something that God does within people that we can't understand, and, and, and we see these things that happen through the Bible. The next act is family, by the way, if you couldn't get what I was saying. In Ruth uh, 4, 13 through 22, uh, we're going to read some of that. And after this, it, it goes into a, uh, halfway down, it goes into this genealogy. From the Old Testament into the New Testament, I had to look this up, the internet is great. There's about 41 genealogies that happen from the Old Testament going into the New Testament. And what's amazing about these genealogies is God is a way of showing like a, a family scrapbook, like a, a, a family book of faith. And sometimes, many of us in here may be the first in our family to start this faith book. Faith book? I don't know. It's like a list of saying Facebook. But um, 
a faith scrapbook of your life and your family that is following this journey. Sometimes you may have been in it forever. I just got a booklet of a family member of, of the clan up front who wrote some of the songs that we sang this morning. They have a heritage of being in the church that goes back centuries. Some of us have a history of being in the family of God that goes back days. <laughs> maybe, maybe but what God does is not only is pe are people that follow this godly people, but every once in a while he'll pluck somebody out and graft them into a family. Someone who doesn't belong there. Somebody who really is a, is a, is a standout. For example, Rahab. Well, somebody said me. That's a good one too. Rahab gets pulled out and plucked in. Ruth is another one of those that gets pulled out and plucked in. When we read about this genealogy, you find out how important those two people were. And so let's read this, and, and, and I'll explain to you the importance of, of these women being grafted in. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who in this day has left you without kinsman or redeemer, May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The woman living with her said, Naomi has a son. And they, and, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Abinadad, Abinadad, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. We see in this journey, do you know Jesse, father of David? Who else is in the line of David? There you go. A son that will be greater than any other son, one born of a virgin, one who came to save us. Could you imagine being a foreigner, trusting in a mother's love of the father, being a part of something? You didn't have family anymore. And all of a sudden, God's blessings, not only with the family here, but your lineage of that family and this faith that you are building on, the scrapbook that you pull out and you start to place all these pictures in of the kids that follow you, what they're doing for the Lord. You start to just sit back and just feel blessed. Many of us here and look around probably have generations that are under you where you can sit back and look and say, I'm so proud that my kids have followed in our footsteps of loving the Lord. I'm so glad that my grandkids have followed their parents' example of following the Lord and trusting Him and moving on. I'm so amazed that my great-grandchildren have followed in the footsteps of my grandchildren. It goes on, it goes on, it goes on. Who knows the impact of what God is doing in that family of faith that will impact the world that we'll see in the future. Maybe there's another uh, David that's coming out from this group. Maybe there's, I want to say there's another Jesus. That won't happen. But our family trees of faith, the coolest part of it is, on that journey you may find somebody that is within your family that was drafted in too. We see that here. Many of you here might not have been in the church until you married into somewhere and you were forced into that grafting. But you've come to love the Lord and you've raised your children up to love the Lord. It's amazing. You are part of the genealogy that carries on as heirs of God's kingdom. It all started with the journey of a loving, godly mother who had this faith. Now, I, I, my mom is here and I really was going to embarrass her with the love that she has, so I'll just do it anyway. Uh, don't look at her. Shh. I have two, two awesome moms that are sitting on the right-hand side, um, the wife of my kids and the mom of us kids. So you can tell that she must have been a patient woman. Uh, but our life kind of uh, goes along with some of these things. We go through some hard times. And there was one rock that was consistent in our lives no matter what, what happened, what went on, the downs, the ups, or whatever it was, my mom's faithfulness to move us forward in a way that was glorifying to God. She didn't do it with many words. Sometimes the best discipline was zero words, and I have felt the worst 
because she had lost her voice and I did some really dumb things. Um, but we had a mom who not only moved us forward to, to know the Lord, but showed it in everything that she did. And we were all blessed by it. So when we get to see the people, you know that somebody is a godly mom when other people call for mom that aren't part of our family. And you may have that too, where people come to your house and your mom is mom to the neighborhood because of the love that she has for people. Dan is a lucky man to be married to my mom. Uh, and he will agree. And she did, not only became mom to the four of us, but mom to three others. Um, grandma to 18, working on 19. We're a busy family. <laughs> and the torch gets passed on because now we see my sister, who is a very godly woman, raising her kids up to know the Lord. We see my step sister, who is a preacher's wife, who is also raising up some very, very godly children. My wife, who is carrying a torch drafted into our family, uh, raising up a preacher's wife, raising up kids to know and love the Lord. And, and we see these things happening. My stepsister raising up the most of the kids. Um, <laughs> I have to say my stepsister, sister-in-law. Stepsister, I don't know. But we get to see the tradition. And my hope is that through the godly examples in your life, you get to carry on the genealogy of love. The genealogy that shows godliness in your family. And along the way, grab some people in. Find some people who look at you and look in your eyes. And all they can say is, I see love. And I see God. Let me join the family. Let's go to God in prayer. And Father, you're an awesome and amazing God. And, you know, we don't deserve the love that you, have, that you have for us. We are so grateful that you do. And God, we are so thankful that um, as this random quote that I read about moms, that maybe you decided that you couldn't be everywhere, so you created moms to help take care of much of the rest. We're so thankful for godly mothers who love us, who raise us up who show us the way to be more like your son. And God, without them in our lives, we, we'd be lost. But I'm also thankful for those who step in when they didn't have to, to be moms to other people. What an amazing gift that is that you put in the hearts of so many women around this world that they can just be mom to people who don't have them. And I'm so thankful for that. And God, I'm thankful for the gift that you give us of, of forgiveness, of patience, of love, of joy, of self-control. And I'm grateful that I have a beautiful example of that in my mom. Again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for opening your word. We thank you for how it speaks to us and share what it means to be uh, your children. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.